Gus Noble. I'm the president of the Chicago Scots. Welcome to the 34th annual Scottish Festival and Highland Games. As you can see, we're a little bit smaller this year, but no less exciting. There are lots of ways you can get involved. Visit the Celtic Marketplace where you can buy lots of Scottish Festival and Highland Games swag and some unique virtual experiences. But something doesn't feel right. I think the weather is just far too good. And that's why we brought in some authentic Scottish rain in a bottle. So those of you who have some authentic Scottish rain handy, join me. Now that feels much better. Let's go to Alan Garraway live in Itasca. It's quiet out here this afternoon, despite the traffic going past on the highway there. But normally this place is a bustle with people and the background music of Celtic rock and pipe bands. All of that bustle is what makes this a really special occasion for me and my family as we all get together to celebrate. I hope you'll enjoy the video clips we put together specially for today. Some new ones and some from years gone by. And if you do enjoy them, I hope you'll go back onto the Chicago Scots website Find the donate button and spend some of that money you normally have spent in beer and pies and donate it to the heroes who work and live at Caledonia Senior Living. Thank you. Hi Chicago, this is Kevin Becker coming to you from Denton, Texas. I'm a professional Highland Games athlete and I've been competing in this sport since 2014. My favorite events in the games are both the weight for distance events and both height events, the weight over the bar and the sheaf toss. Beyond the events, the thing I like the most about the Highland Games is to be able to get together with such a great group of people from all over the country and compete. Chicago has traditionally been one of my favorite games. Chicago always attracts a great group of athletes and has one of the best crowds. I've been training hard for the 2021 Chicago Games and can't wait to get there. It's a hot day in Texas today, but I'm going to get out and get a few events in to get some practice and some training for the 2021 Games. We hope you're all doing well and can't wait to see you in 2021 at the Chicago Highland Games. favorite part of the Highland Games were always the heavy athletics growing up. It was my favorite thing to watch with my dad and we loved watching the caber toss and the sheath toss and being able to see that and seeing records being set and having autographs afterwards was always my favorite part besides the dancing obviously because I'm a dancer. <laughs> This dance is the Highland Fling. It's likely the oldest of all the traditional Scottish dances. It's said to have begun in battle by the soldiers who danced on their upturned shields to celebrate their victories.
Hello, I'm Constance Nestor. I've had the pleasure these eight years of chairing the Scottish American History Forum. During my short talk today, I want to tell you about the history of the Scottish games in the United States. Highland games are thought to have originated from the great gatherings and fairs held by Scottish Highland clans since medieval times, where clans competed against one another in feats of strength and skill. As early as the 11th century, King Malcolm III is known to have held athletic competitions to determine the strongest and the fastest. The formal, more ceremonial Highland Games came about later in the early 1800s as part of the romanticizing of the Highland culture during the Victorian age. Scots immigrated to other countries for many reasons, among them, the sheer pursuit of a better life in the Americas. Immigrant Caledonian societies were formed in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and wherever around the globe Scots met and reunited. In 2020, our 34th Chicago Scots Scottish Festival and Highland Games is being held on the very same day as our 104th Scottish Home Picnic, being held in North Riverside, Illinois, at the Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care Campus, of which we are most proud. For more information on Chicago Scots, check our website. I'll hope to see you at the games in person next year. Enjoy the games. Hello. Hello. I'm Scott. And I'm Claire, and together we are Noisemaker, and we are thrilled to be joining you for this year's virtual Highland Games. So Claire and I are coming to you live from Scotland, where we can confirm that the weather here is very, very gruesome and very, very, very atrocious. So we're glad that we get to be inside our cosy little living room to talk to you today. Um, Scott and I are musical theatre writers and for the past seven years we've been writing lots of shows both in Scotland and now the United States and last year we were really excited to come over and work at Northwestern University in Chicago and there we met Gus who invited us to come down and visit the Caledonia Senior Living. And while we were there, we got to meet some of the incredible residents and see some of the amazing facilities that have been built there. But more than that, it was the one place in Chicago we got to experience some Scottish hospitality, which we were really grateful for. While we were there too, we got to spend some time with Gus, who we understand over this particularly difficult period of time everywhere has gone above and beyond for the residents and for the building. So we just want to send him some special love from us and to the rest of you watching. So tonight, we're really excited to be sharing a brand new song with you from our latest show called Kaylee. Uh, warning, there's quite a lot of Scottish language in it, so we're going to put some words up on the screen so you can all follow along. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, I assume you'll do, but for those that don't know what a Kaylee is, Kaylee is a Scottish tradition where there is a gathering of people that come together and sharing dances and songs that have been passed down through generations through Scottish history. Uh, this song is called uh, Something Like This, which is about dances being handed down through time. And although some of the steps get muddled up along the way, we keep dancing nonetheless. We hope you enjoy and have an amazing event. Old Duncan the Stout was a man who loved to dance. He'd summon all his clan when e'er he found a chance. First he'd lead them in a toast and command they get in pairs. The dance we dance tonight will be danced for a hundred years. So Duncan he taught Patrick, the caller after him, the steps to his dance so it could be taught again. When Duncan died in battle, Patrick called the clan. Find yourselves a partner and let's celebrate our man. But as the caller takes a swig, mug of ale The steps he swore he'd learn to lead seem lacking in detail Holy Moses my mind's gone blank Was it two steps forward then another back It seems unfair of me to call it his All I know is it was something, something, something Arrives for the dance to be passed 
on Legend says that every caller somehow hears it wrong From Duncan to Patrick to Arabella in her stoop To the chief who thought he'd write it down but dropped it in his soup To the caller in Rossyth who failed to inform The caller in Kincaid as he told it in a storm But still it does survive as callers muddle through And now it's found its way to here Society from Peter Georgeson and our good friends at the Scott Forge Company. Uncle Pete was from the Shetland Islands and he was a great bagpiper. Bagpiping and drumming are really important to this Scottish community and to our Scottish festival in Highland Games. And I'd like to introduce you to somebody who is really important to bagpiping and drumming. Jim Sim is president of the Midwest Pipe Band Association. And it's because of Jim's energy and his leadership that our games have grown into the largest piping and drumming championships in North America. Let's go meet Jim. Jim, the piping community has been very good to this organization through the years. And I know there's a philanthropic spirit that uh, is shared across the piping and drumming community. Could you talk about some uh, details of what that spirit looks like? Certainly, um, we are, we're always very grateful to the society here because this very room is where we hold our annual general meetings every year and have for many, many years. Very, very thankful for that. Um, but we have, uh, as an association with the Houston hurricane floods a few years ago, we helped out some fellow pipers and drummers there. We've helped out some people in California with uh, fires, with the, with the forest fires. And um, just, um, Right now, we're, we're doing some other things because we can. But um, there's one thing we've done for the last several years. There's an organization um, in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, uh, that works with disadvantaged youths and teach them, teaches them piping and drumming, Brazilians. And, um, and of course, they're, they're always looking for equipment, pipes, drums, uniforms, what have you. So we have made it a point, several of the bands have chipped in, as has the association, to donate these items to this group in Brazil. And of course, they're very, being very hard hit with the COVID right now. And um, so we're always looking out for them and we hope that some of the some of the boys down in Brazil might be watching this. And um, we're right there with you and we wish you all the best. Can you please explain for everyone the, the different grades of pipe bands that play at the games? The starting grade, the grade five, plays eight parts of a quick march. Uh, for instance, Scotland the Brave is a quick march. So it would be something you could march to for eight parts of music. Uh, the grade four bands take a step up. They play what we call our mini MSR, which is a march to spay and reel, but the tunes can be just two-parted. So they're typically a little bit easier for the bands to play. And they also play a medley, it's one or the other. Uh, the grade three bands play a three to five minute medley or a full march to spay and reel of four-parted tunes. That's kind of the big step. And then the grade two bands play a five, uh, sorry, four to six minute medley, uh, as well as a march to spay and reel. And they actually have to submit two march to spays and reels, and then they draw out the line for which one they're going to play. So every time you go up in the grade, it's a little bit more challenging in the music. Jim, I've always enjoyed Midlothian's performances at the Feast of the Haggis, when you had those pipers up on the balcony at the Hilton and the various locations and hotels we've been to through the years. 
you, you started Midlothian again in the 70s, didn't you? And, and the progression, as, I, as I've heard, it went from grade four to grade one in less than 10 years. Tell me about that experience, if you would. Well, um, we were kind of, at least I was flying blind. It was Pipe Major Ian Swinton, who had a lot more experience than I had. I was 19 when we started the band. Um, in 1975, the village of Midlothian wanted to start a band. So they came to Ian and me. And to Ian's credit, I was the one that said, I didn't want to stay in Chicago. I was going to go up and play in Canada. And Ian insisted and insisted and insisted. And I found out I couldn't go to college in Canada because I needed a, a fifth year of high school, which they had at the time. So I stayed and I said, I'll give you one year. Well, then I stayed for 35 years. And um, Ian and I, uh, together, we, we taught piping and drumming in the Melodian Park District. And many of, the, uh, many of the players that came through the band came through that program. There are a couple that are still in the band today that came through that program in 1975. Wow. Um, but we started in grade four, which at that time was the lowest grade. There was no grade five. We tied for third in our first contest and then built the band up over 10 years to, to be promoted into grade one. In the process, we won champion supreme in Ontario, Canada in 1981 in grade three and in 1984 in grade two. And that's when we were promoted to grade one. We used to go to Canada five and six times a summer to play there because there were no games here for us to play in. So it was, uh, it was a terrific experience. We stayed in grade one for a few years and then um, due to some personnel issues, we dropped down to grade two and we felt that it was a comfortable grade for the band to perpetuate itself. And then we stayed in grade two till I left the band in 2009. Um, very competitive, the last uh, three contests at the North American Championship, we were second each year. And my last contest in 2009, um, we won the drumming at, at the North American Championship. Midlothian is still performing? Midlothian's going strong. Um, they, they've had many successes since I've left the band and are, are doing very well and still perform at the Feast of the Haggis. It's the night of the year where they, they give such a terrific performance. And time, after, year after year, I, I welcome new visitors who are their first involvement with this community is at the Feast of the Haggis. And the memory they take with them is of the pipers playing particularly Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a powerful and evocative moment and symbolic for many, many people. It certainly is, yeah. So that's the future of the band. But talk for a moment, if you would, about the future of the games. Where do you see us headed in the future? So our little section of what we uh, see going forward, and we've talked about as a pipe band association here in the Midwest, is to um, accentuate and maybe get more elaborate with the concert formation to maybe make it more of an actual symphonic type thing where we might have risers we've talked about that to make it more um, better for the bands and more definite where they need to be um, we certainly want to grow the numbers we had 50 con 50 performances in 2019 we'd like to grow that in all the grades grades two through five and, um, and certainly make it a really band experience. The contest is run by players that are, or ex-players that used to play, and we knew how we wanted to be treated. And that's how we try and treat the pipers, drummers, and the bands all together. So uh, we've made it a good contest, hope to make it better. And um, anything that changes for the better, we're all for it. It's kind of unique to pipe bands. When you go to watch a pipe band in a competition, the, the pipers and drummers' backs are to the audience, which, in a musical sense doesn't make, can you imagine the Beatles playing with their backs to you? So um, it, I, the first time I heard about a concert formation in a contest was in the 1970s from pipe major Bob Shepard of the Dyser and the Donald Band in Scotland. And he mentioned it, it should be happening in the 1970s. And here we are at 2020 and it still really isn't caught on. Um, it's being discussed from what I understand a little bit in Scotland now, maybe for the worlds. Um, but, I, but I think it's a unique thing that we do here right now and the bands seem to enjoy it. It's a little bit more of a challenge again to how you form up because there's no restrictions to how you form up, which you see all different types of concert formations. Um, so I think that's a very important thing that we do too is we, we put that added challenge on the bands and the spectators, our, our feedback has been great because they get to see everything and nobody's hiding behind someone's back. They get to see all the players. Uh, they get to see the drums play. It, it's really um, a neat thing for the spectators to see. But last year, I thought, was a particularly incredible performance. I looked from end to end, there were band after band after band. How many did we have last year? 
uh, in the mass bands there were 39 bands. Oh. It's a nice finish on the day and you go and have a pint afterwards and with a lot of your friends you only see the one time a year it's a it's a marvelous day marvelous weekend well thank you jim for everything you do for this community for piping for the scottish community uh, and thanks for your friendship i appreciate time spent with you jim and right back at you gus and we as a midwest pipe band association we'd like to thank the Illinois standard society and chicago scots for giving us an opportunity to put on a great contest we, we appreciate it. We appreciate all the, the pipers and drummers out there of every age, of every skill level. We, we look forward to seeing you in 2021. Band, by the roll, click, march. We are youth players from the Turlocker Pipe Band in Grinnell, Iowa. Altogether, Turlocker has 10 players under 18 years old. And we really miss playing for you at this year's Chicago Highland Games. So here's a big shout out to the Chicago Scots and to all the fantastic residents and staff at Caledonia Senior Living. From The skirl of the pipes, the swish of the kilts and the heavy events like the caper toss are all part of the wonderful celebration of Scottish culture that we call the Highland or Heeland Games. They so much embody the uh, Scottish character, perseverance against the odds, uh, a never say die attitude, a sense of history and belonging, and above all, fun and laughter. And these are traits that are serving us well today as we fight successfully against COVID-19 in the senior living and memory care homes that this tremendous organization, the Chicago Scots, both supports and runs. Today, our heroes are the amazing staff on the front line of this battle. A couple of weeks ago, I moved into the Scottish home and I lived here for a while. During the COVID lockdown, I wanted to see the world through the eyes of the people who live and work here. What I saw assured and inspired me. I saw people who cared deeply for one another. I also looked out beyond the walls of our campus. I saw people who believe in the purpose and the promise of our 175-year-old mission. I saw you. All around me, I saw people with beauty in their hearts and strength in their backbones. People who will not quit because they know right from wrong. People who will not be stopped by the pain of today, for they know that beyond it lies a better time. Nothing is more important than the people who live and work here. We care deeply about them. Through their eyes, I see reasons to be hopeful. I want you to know that Caledonia Senior Living does not have any residents or staff with COVID-19. Three things made this happen. Luck, the grace of a higher power, and the vigilance of our staff. 
My colleagues are incredible. When history recalls them, she will smile. Think of this. Despite two world wars, the Great Depression, the Great Chicago Fire, and the Spanish Flu, this Scottish society has prevailed. That's because we've stayed true to our roots and our values. For 175 years, we've delivered life's most important things, home, family, and love. And that's exactly what we're going to continue to do. Whether it's COVID-19 that attacks our seniors, or systemic racism that attacks our people and our principles, we fight. My friends, our time is now. Please give your time, talent, money, energy, or ideas. Do what you can do. The heroic people of Caledonia need you. Thank you. I have been Scottish dancing for about 21 years now, but I really was born and raised at the Scottish home. Could do it, walk around that building with my eyes closed. It's been really important to me in my entire life and all of the adults who work at the Scottish home, the residents, the board members have kind of raised me um, into the person I am with those wonderful Scottish values. And I really appreciate that and I credit a lot of the things in my life to that upbringing. Um, so with the Scottish dancers, we often perform for like the New Year's Eve party for the residents. We perform for the Christmas party for the residents, we have the Scottish home picnic, things like that, that we can just kind of jump in and do a little dance for. Um, I've also volunteered and played bingo, which is happening right now at the Scottish home apparently, um, and been a color for bingo. Um, but I've also really cherished just kind of walking around the building and seeing open doors and being able to go talk to residents and make new friends with the residents. Um, and then dancing on Tuesday afternoons outside of the Scottish home during the pandemic has brought a lot of joy and kind of made us feel really special that we get to share what we love to do in a way that's providing service for people who are stuck in their rooms and, um, you know, see the same four walls. So it's nice for them to look outside and see little faces and see my big face and my tall body um, dancing along with little cuties. During the lockdown, I wrote letters to the residents at the Scottish home and colored pictures for the residents at the McLean house. And I thought it was a lot of fun to do that because I know that they may not have people who are doing that and I thought it would be fun and nice to do that for them. To help the um, Scottish home, I um, wrote letters to the, um, the residents there and um, I like doing that because um, it kind of felt like, because um, they don't really, um, like they, their family can't visit them now so they still have friends outside of the Scottish home. At the Scottish home, I wrote letters to a couple of the residents who liked the Cycling Without Age program. And I thought that was a lot of fun because I can relate in like liking to go on bike rides and just connecting with people. I've been involved with Sherlock Earth since I was 13 um, here in Iowa. So we were pretty uh, distanced from the Scottish home. But what we did on Monday um, made some recordings of the band play like um, you know, from an aerial angle, and um, we're kind of getting that made into a music video, and we're going to send that um, to the Scottish home just to show, you know, how appreciative we are, and like getting to play for centers like that is really nice, and we miss doing that a lot. I wrote letters to the residents at the home, and um, I think for me, what I took from it was like, um, I think it's just, it's really important to not feel so alone, especially during these times. And I think it's so easy to feel disconnected. And I think, in my opinion, I feel like people are valuing this kind of um, human connection that we all innately need and have. And I feel like it's so important to recognize the yeah importance of that. And I'm just really grateful I could have contributed and, um, you know, made someone's day just better. It's just really important. And I feel like it's a lasting thing they can always 
had. I dance on Tuesdays for the residents, and I also wrote some letters for the residents. And I really enjoy dancing on Tuesdays. I like getting to see the residents, and um, there are some reoccurring ones that we see every time that I get excited to see. I wrote letters. I yeah, I wrote letters. I played music mm-hmm. for them. I yeah, lots of music. I think music is the main thing. I played lots of music. How did that make you feel? Happy. Yeah. And I danced for them. Hi, my name is Coleman. I'm seven years old. I just finished my first year of this one has a Highland dancing. And I love dancing for the residents because it makes them so happy. Hi, I'm Erin Earls. I'm a member of the Lake Forest High School dance team. And we're all here today at the Caledonia Senior Living Center. Uh, to spruce up the outdoor living area for both the seniors and the families who are coming to visit their loved ones at a safe distance. And we're volunteering to make a difference in the lives of the seniors, and we hope that you are all inspired to do the same. Uh, Here are the members of the Lake Forest Dance Team. Hi, I'm Mary. Hi, I'm Tess. Hi, I'm Caroline. And we hope to see you all at a future Highland Games. That's kind of our goal with this group, is that we're all, you know, the youth who have been touched in some way by the society. And um, I think it's really important. Something I like to say is like, ask not what an organization can do for you, but what you can do for the organization. What are you going to miss about being able to actually go to the Highland Games this year? Drinking Iron Brew and watching the dogs. Drinking Iron Brew and watching the dogs do the courses. And also, also the tossing the cable. Tossing. And I like to see those people trying to, um, I think they were doing. Oh, yeah. and also the mini golf, that's fun. The mini golf. Yeah, I like the mini golf. favorite part of the Highland Games was the soccer obviously but since that's no longer around we love the mass pipes and drums the food's always good the beer and especially the whiskey what's your favorite part Aaron? Highland cow. The Highland cow that's always a winner. With Nessie. <laughs> well Nessie's back in Scotland whether he exists or not I don't know but we're sorry we missed everyone this year and we'll hopefully see everyone out again next year. Hey St. Andrews Society, what's going on? This is the hometown favorite, Tom Soroka. I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I've been attending the Chicago Highland Games since 2010 when we were all the way back at the Itasca Polo Grounds. Nothing beats the Chicago crowd that comes around the field for the pro athletes when we're tossing the caber. So that is the one thing I cannot wait to get back to for the 2021 competition. But until that time, here are some clips of me doing what I do best, and that's beating everybody else at the caber. See you guys next year. Woo!
Hi, I'm Rachel Barton Pine. And I'm Sylvia Michelle Pine. And we're going to play for you a medley of some of our favorite Scottish jigs. We're going to start with a traditional 18th century tune called Middling Thank You. Then we're going to go on to a tune that I composed called The Black Spirit Horses. And then we're going to finish off with a tune that I composed, except Sylvia gave it its title. The Whiskey Barrel. I couldn't believe that there wasn't already a tune called The Whiskey Barrel, but now there is. Here are our jigs. Everybody, I'm Katie Crowley. I'm a physical therapist from La Crosse, Wisconsin. I've been competing in the Highland Games for over a decade. My favorite event is the caber toss. If you see me on the field doing a cartwheel, I just turned a 12. Come on out to Chicago in 2021 and support your favorite thrower. is a sword dance, also known as Gilly Callum. It's said that if a soldier could perform the dance without his feet ever touching the swords, that he would have good luck in battle.
Good afternoon. I'm Camilla Hellman, President of the American Scottish Foundation. And on behalf of ASF, we send strong thoughts and best wishes to the Chicago Scots and Scottish home on this, your very first virtual Highland Games. We may not be together with you in person, but we are in spirit. Our very best wishes to you today. One of the best things about the Highland Games is the classic British car show. Take a look. Hello, Alfred Kitch. Uh, Highland Games, I've been attending Highland Games when they were in Oak Brook. And this is a Lotus 7, second version. Notice on the name, it says Lotus Super 7. which everyone here puts in front of the driver is in front of the passenger. It gives them something to look at. Folks, isn't it such a real treat to have Rachel Barton Pine and her daughter Sylvia playing for us at the Virtual Highland Games today? Rachel accepted our highest honour a few years ago, our Distinguished Citizen Award. She is truly one of the greatest musicians that play uh, any form of music today, as you're about to see. I was in Scotland a few years ago and I was uh, privileged to see Rachel perform with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra at the Queen's Hall in Edinburgh. Towards the end of the show, as I'm sitting in the audience with my parents, Rachel reached for her violin and she played the tune we're about to hear now and it blew the roof off the place. It was incredible. So here she is, Rachel Barton Pike. Thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this year's virtual Highland Games. I'm so proud to be part of the Chicago Scots and so this is in honor of Chicago and in honor of Gus Noble and the blues. Sweet home, Chicago. Thank you, Rachel. Wasn't that incredible? Folks, there are three types of people in this world. There are Scots, there are people who want to be Scots, and there are people with no ambition whatsoever. 
a toast to Scotland. Hi, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Joni Smith and I'm the head of the Scottish Government team based in Washington DC. I'm absolutely thrilled to be joining you at the Chicago Scots Virtual Highland Games. Whilst we dearly love to be with you in person, we're absolutely delighted that Chicago Scots are bringing this to you all from the comfort of your own home. And there's sure to be something for everyone. With pipe bands, to Highland dancing, to heavyweight athletics, there's something for everybody to enjoy. The Chicago Scots truly represent the Scottish values of community and generosity, and their principal charity, the Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Centre, have been working tirelessly and gaining recognition for their work to keep residents safe in these recent times. So to all at the Chicago Scots, we say thank you, congratulations, and well done on all your efforts over the last few months and to bring these virtual Highland Games to life. Congratulations and enjoy the Chicago Scots Virtual Highland Games 2020. My name is Linda Rosenberg. One of my favorite memories from the Highland Games was going to a games meeting where everyone introduced themselves. One man said his name was Tom Funderick. I asked him if he had a brother, Dave. He did. I told him, I'm fairly certain we're cousins. We had not seen each other for over 50 years since we were small children. So you never know what you're gonna find at the Highland Games. Well. It's just you and me this year. Do you want to volunteer? I don't know if I can get a t-shirt your size. We can try. Don't be mad. Hi, I'm Laura Nelson, volunteer coordinator. Usually by now I would have spoken to hundreds of people either checking in to volunteer or take part in the competitions. But this year, I get to put my feet up and watch the festival along with you. Thank you to Chicago Scots for figuring out how to put on a festival this year. What a great way to continue the tradition. To all of the volunteers out there watching, I'm glad you get the time off to enjoy the festivities. We wouldn't be able to put on a festival like this without you, so I hope to see all of you back next year in your usual positions. To the diehard ladies who volunteer with me every year up on the front lines, checking everyone in, rest up and enjoy your day off because I need you all back next year. So to all the volunteers, I toast you all. So, what do you think? Wait, come back here. Do you think you think you want to volunteer next year? Can I sign you up? I think you'd be great for security. Greetings from the virtual clan tent of the clan McFarlane. I'm John Manchester. I'm the commissioner for Illinois. Our arms feature the Royal Crown of Scotland and the motto, this I'll defend. So, lock sloy! And thank you. Fisker Ma. I am Vincent Henderson, Vice President and General Counsel of the Clan Henderson Society from Little Rock, Arkansas. The Hendersons are there. Our clan has participated in the Chicago Scott Scottish Festival of Highland Games in the past, and we look forward to the opportunity to do it again next year. Until next year, Martian leave Adrasta. Hi, my name is Maggie Sim, and I've been the Illinois St. Andrew Society Heather Queen for the past two years. I'm here to congratulate the new Heather Queen, Erin, on her reign for the upcoming year. I'm so excited to pass this crown down to her and see what great things she'll do this next year. 
During my reign the past two years, I've created youth engagement opportunities at the Chicagoland Highland Games, as well as advocate for the Cal Caledonia House and spread awareness about Scottish culture here in Chicagoland. I have had the greatest time being your Heather Queen for the past two years. Congratulations to Erin. I know you'll do great. Hi, my name is Bess Schulmeister. I'm the Vice President of the Scottish Genealogy Group of Chicago Scots. As you can guess from our name, we help support each other in researching our Scottish roots. We in the Scottish Genealogy Group would like to help you record and preserve your family's part in this proud heritage of Scotland the Brave. All the best to you and your family. For the past 25 years, Sterling Engineering has looked forward to being part of the Highland Games and the gathering of the clans. We are very glad to see that despite the challenges we face this year with COVID-19, the virtual event is happening and look forward to 2021 when we can all be back at the Games together to enjoy the massing of the bands, my favourite part. Francis Villan and I've been involved uh, with the Highland Games for 33 years and I hope it goes for another 33 years or more. I've been involved with the, the, the Scottish home for more than 50 years. This dance is the Irish jig. In the Scottish version, it's the story of a washerwoman who comes out to find that her clean laundry has all been knocked to the ground, either by neighborhood children or some say by her husband that came home after a wee bit too much to drink. My favorite memory of the Chicago Highland Games is when it was held in Grant Park. The pipe band came up over the hill and it had the Chicago skyline in the background. It gave me goosebumps. Hi, I'm Matt McKee, pipe major of the Chicago Stockyard Kilty Band. And I'm Dave McKee Jr., drum sergeant of the Chicago Stockyard Kilty Band. The Chicago Stockyard Kilty Band, or SYKB, will be celebrating its 100th anniversary next year in 2021. The band was founded in 1921 by brothers Robert and Jim Sim, veterans of World War I, and has a long, proud history of our association with the Illinois St. Andrews Society. That's right, Matt. The Chicago Stockyard Kilty Band had the honor of being the first pipe band for the Illinois St. Andrews Society. The Chicago Stockyard Kilty Band, or SYKB, also played the dedication for the opening of the new wing of the Scottish Old Folks Home back in 1964. The band SYKB also enjoyed playing for the 180th anniversary of the Chicago St. Andrews Society. Our drums major, Jane McKenzie, also was on the board of directors for the Scottish Old Folks Home. The Chicago Stockyard Kilty Band has a long and proud tradition with the Chicago Scots, and we hope this tradition will continue for another 100 years. We hope you have a safe, an enjoyable summer 
and we hope to see you next year in 2021 in April for our 100th anniversary. Hi sports fans, Luke Crowley here coming to you live from my gym in La Crosse, Wisconsin. My training partners and I have been really hitting it hard this off season, getting ready for Chicago 2021, where you can watch me throw my favorite event, the heavyweight, and my least favorite events, all the other ones. Um, I've been a professional thrower for five years now. I'm a corrections officer by trade and uh, voted prettiest Highland gamer and most likely to fall down by my peers. So can't wait to see you on the field. Hi, my name is Andrew. And my favorite part of the Highland Games is visiting Mike the Cookie Vendor. Hi, my name is Nick. Welcome to the 2020 Highland Games, hosted by Chicago Scots. Today I'm going to teach you how to make Scottish shortbread. You're going to need a half a pound of butter, half a cup of powdered sugar, and two and a quarter cups of flour. First, you're going to take your, your two sticks of butter, which is a half a pound, and then you're going to put in your mixing bowl. This is a half a pound. Next, we need two and a quarter cups of sifted flour. Take your sifted flour and pour it into the cup with the butter. Now, take your half half a cup of, sh of powdered sugar and put it in. Now we're going to knead with our hands for five minutes. So five minutes are done. Next, you're going to want to preheat your oven to 350 degrees. 
Now you're going to want to get a 9 inch pie plate. I'm going to take your dough, put it in the pie plate. If you want the shape of your pie pan to show up, you can take your knuckles and just press it in like, like so. Then you can flatten it out. I'm going to have it evenly pressed. So, if you find a crack, just take some dough, just put it in. So, next you're going to take any fork and put a couple holes in it so the air can come out. Now, once your oven is up to 350 degrees, you can put it in for 40 to 45 minutes. Wash your hands before you take the food out of the oven. You're gonna want a wooden cut cutting board, right? You're gonna want a golden brown edge, like like so. Then you're gonna want to let it cool for ten minutes. Be back in 10 minutes. Now after 10 minutes of it cooling, what you want to do, you want to take like a cutting board, like a slab of like wood, make sure it's clean, put it above it, take it, flip it upside down. Then, if it comes out nicely, you'll get a nice short plate. Now, you're going to want to take a knife and cut it. You have to cut it while it's warm. Then, you can either eat it warm or you can let them cool. I'm going to try one of them warm. My name is Nick, and I'm with the Chicago Scots for our 2020 Highland Games. Hope you enjoyed our virtual Highland Games. The question I'm asked most often is this, Gus, has anyone ever been thrown out of Scotland for being too good looking? And my answer is always the same, Exhibit A, my pal all the way from Patna in Ayrshire, John A. Ballantyne. Now John and I grew up on separate coasts in Scotland, him on the west, me on the east, we never met there. But when we moved to Chicago, we met and we discovered that we both loved and listened to and played the music of Maywood's finest, John Prine. So we decided the most logical thing two Scots in Chicago could do is form a honky-tonk band. John's a great scholar of the Scottish roots of country music and he's written a brilliant song about exactly that. So here's my pal, John Ballantyne. Country music, honky-tonk music, 
like everything else that's valuable in this world actually came from Scotland. Scotland and Ireland, to be precise. Even country music is our fault. And uh, but we make no apology. Uh, it's, it's kind of in our blood. There's a, if you think about country music, all the songs of uh, drinking and the heartache and uh, all of that, so it has to be Scottish, right? And those folks, those brave people who got on those small sailing ships to travel to the, the colonies um, at that time, um, deserve our respect. And they, they brought the music and the culture with them. So here's a song uh, that talks about one of those ships, one of those boats that they got on was, was uh, interestingly named the William and Mary. How come it's whiskey that eases your pain? That song that you're singing was my mother's refrain When she sailed on the William and Mary The William and Mary, just 80 feet long She braved the Atlantic and weathered each storm A hundred good souls with no place to belong the William and Mary They gathered in Belfast In dawn's early light Farmers and pilgrims And girls of the night They knew how to drink And they knew how to fight When they sailed on The William and Mary So where did the Cumberland Gap get its name? How come it's whiskey that brought with them songs, they brought with them bones of dear Robert Burns, they landed in Philly to flutes and to drums, God bless the William and Mary, and southward to find Appalachia they grown, the valleys and mountains bring memories of home, new songs to be singing like babies are born. Children of William and Mary. So where did the Cumberland Gap get its name? How come it's whiskey that eases your pain? That song that you sing in was my mother's refrain when she sailed on the William and Mary. When she sailed on. Hey Chicago, Kendall Thomas here letting you know that the Chicago Scottish Festival and Highland Games is coming back in 2021. Hope you're ready for some more fun events like the Sheaf, the Hammer, the Wait for Distance, and the Caber. We'll see you guys next year. Well folks, we're getting to the final stretch now. Before we get there, however, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where I come from. I come from a land, the west coast of Europe, where there are four mystic tribes of people, very ancient tribes. There are the Welsh who prey on their knees and often on their neighbours. There are the Irish who don't know what they want, but they'll fight you for it. There are the Scots who will always pour a good whiskey on your grave, but only after they've passed it through their kidneys first. And then there are the English who think they invented themselves, which relieves God of a terrible responsibility. Well, Rabbi, in this part, you're going to hear my pal, Jamie, sing one of your songs. 
Folks, thanks for watching today. Thanks for being part of the Chicago Scots. Enjoy. I just want to thank Goss, Alan and the whole team for putting together the virtual Highland Games. Incredible achievement. COVID's not going to stop the Highland Games. Well done, Goss. Well done, Alan. Have a great time, everyone. Thanks for your support. Cheers. Hi, my name is Lisa Hafner, and I am from Fort Worth, Texas, and I will be one of your professional athletes competing in the Highland Games next year in 2021. So a little bit about me. So I first began in track and field, and I switched over to Highland Games because it's so fun and interesting and mostly difficult. But it's been so great, and the people are wonderful, and the fans in the crowd are even the best and cheering us on. Um, I have a few titles, um, Women's World Champion from 2016, and then uh, Women's National Champion from 2018, as well as a North American Champion from 2018. And then a few world records, some of them have been taken away, but if you have seen Lightweight for Distance or Sheaf, Sheaf I still have that world record in the um, heavier bag and so those are a few things you can look forward to as some of us will be setting world records in Chicago in 2021 and if I had to pick a favorite event I think if I had to pick a favorite event I would probably choose Sheaf. So Sheaf is the one right here where you can see where the standards and we're going to go up as high as possible and you were cheering helps that go even higher so that is something to look forward to. and some things that you can look forward to seeing. And we can't wait to be back in Chicago in 2021. See you there. Hello, this is Dan Tesh, band manager for the Chicago Highlanders. On behalf of the Highlanders, our thoughts go out to the residents and staff of the Scottish home in Caledonia Senior Living. 2020 has certainly been a challenging year. The Highlanders are looking forward to a better 2021 as next year we'll be celebrating our 100 year anniversary. Keep an eye on our website and social media for details and enjoy the virtual games. One of my favorite memories of the Highland Games was the year of the cicadas. They were everywhere. While the kids danced, they flew around, they joined them in the sword dance, they landed on them while doing the fling. It was a lot of fun that year with all our little flying friends. You know, we were going to have a really special guest at the Highland Games this year, the National Chef of Scotland. Gary McLean was going to be with us to give some cooking demonstrations. But COVID-19. Gary called, however, and said, let's stay connected. And in a really thoughtful and generous way, he helped create a special Mother's Day meal for the residents of Caledonia Senior Living. And he's also offered to help create a special meal for the Feast of the Haggis. As well as being the National Chef of Scotland, Gary won in 2016 MasterChef UK, the professionals, and he beat out 47 other chefs in the UK. So let's take a listen to a great conversation I enjoyed with Gary McLean. Gary, to start with, tell us what it was like to compete on MasterChef, the professionals, and win the top prize. First of all, it was strange to win it. Um... You know, it's a, it's a process that lasts about a year and you really bond with everyone and you get into a kind of strange routine that you're filming every day and you're, you're, you're on camera and you've made arguably friends for life. And to win it was kind of bittersweet that you knew it was over, you know. And then you, it was quite a strange feeling being the last one there. Um, the, the big thing about me winning it was uh, because I'm a college lecturer. Uh, it was quite a brave move in the first place to go on it. And, uh, you know, I think someone of my age and my kind of position in, 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 in the culinary world in Scotland, that was quite a surprise to a lot of people that I did it. Um, but fundamentally, I did it because of my total master chef nerve. I absolutely love it. It's my favourite show. And I went on and I kind of had the, the, my thought process was just to enjoy myself, to enjoy the experience, to enjoy the people that I'd met and not look, not to look daft on telly. And that was my only objective. And as each 
episode or week or, 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 or month went past, I, uh, I survived and I survived another day and the more I was there, the more I loved it. But not once did I ever think I was going to win it, even when I was standing there with the, the other two finalists, I never thought I was going to win. I wanted also to ask you about the uh, the um, national chef of Scotland and being yep. kind of the representative for Scottish food and and how to to teach people how to to make the most of locally sourced, healthy, sustainable, and affordable food. Um, yeah. Tell me about the role and and why it's uh, particularly important to you and to to Scotland as a country. The role itself, national chef of Scotland, had been spoke about for a few years prior to uh, anyone getting it and uh, I always thought it would go to the great and the good little did I believe it was, it was going to go to me but I think for someone like me it's better suited someone that can actually devote the time it's a voluntary position which takes up a lot of time um, it, it came with a kind of four page remit of the responsibilities and stuff like that and I kind of thought if I'm going to tackle four pages of a remit I'll accomplish nothing. And mm -hmm. so what I've mainly focused on is uh, teaching kids to cook, teaching people to cook, teaching families to cook, and um, food poverty is another thing that I've tackled. And that's when I've got my national chef hat on, that is um, mainly what I deal with. It's a wee bit doom and gloom. It's a wee bit of... Um, this is how it, how it should could be done. This is how. So there's a lot of things like like planning meals and and just helping normal families sort of try and improve what they what they eat and and stuff like that. And ironically, um, the the lockdown in Scotland has totally increased everybody's ability to cook because people have now taken food. Everyone was locked in. There was nothing else to do. So people kind of looked at. Um, budgeting controls of what they were buying, they weren't wasting any food and they were getting online and watching chefs do live shows or, or watching YouTube or, or picking up cookbooks. So we had a, we had a generational change in 14 weeks. Um, I think something crazy like 47% of Scots are now cooking more than they did before, which for me is a total win. There's another side to the National Chef is I do a lot of travelling. I do a lot of travelling for my job. Uh, at college, I'm, I'm, I look after a kind of international, a little, a little bit of the international links and stuff like that. And it kind of crosses over a little bit to National Chef. Um, so I get to travel a wee bit and show off for amazing food. So it's the opposite of pretty much what I do in Scotland. So I'm a wee bit doom and gloom uh, about, you know, health and well-being and the positives of cooking. And then I go, I travel to Asia or the States and I stand there with my chest out telling everyone Scotland's food's the best. You've been here previously to Chicago some years ago, haven't you? Yeah, it's been uh, 20 years since I've been in Chicago. Uh, I think it was uh, 2000. Right. And I was over, it was part of Tartan Week right at the very, very start. So I think it was the second Tartan Week in New York. And there was some events that were getting held by you guys to support yep. it. So we were doing the kind of the, the Chicago side of Tartan Week. Our mission is to nourish Scottish identity. Yep. What does Scottish identity mean to you? Well, I think there's a there's a couple of sides to it. There's um, there is dare I say it, the shortbread tin style, uh, where we've got our great heritage and image. You know, we've got. We've got kilts and we've got Nessie and we've got the castle and we've got shortbread and we've got haggis and all those things that people think about. And the other side of it is the modern Scotland uh, technology, the, 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 the way that there's a, there's a lot of things in Scotland that we lead the world in that we don't probably celebrate as much. But for me, I think we have got, with a, with a marketing and a branding hat on, we have got such an amazing image. We've got such an amazing, um, likable, everything about us. You know, wherever a Scotsman goes in the world, you know, you're greeted with a smile. You're greeted with enthusiasm. What's your favourite food to cook with and why? Oh, um, again, I like local produce. Um, I think most chefs would say fish and shellfish because it's instantaneous. Yeah. You know, and uh, the margin for error is quite 
small. But I'm a, I'm kind of funny. I love I love it all. I love doing pastry. I love I love standing plucking birds. I love butchery. I love, you know I love it all. There's not a lot in the kitchen that I don't like. You know something like shelling peas. I could stand I could stand for hours just shelling peas. You know that thing. I just enjoy being with good food. I've got um I've got a, I've got two wee ones and three and three big ones. And my my, my youngest he is uh, he loves helping out. And sometimes, again, it's, you know, you're, everybody's busy and you're just in from work and you're trying to feed the family. And if you've got a wee one, arguably pulling at your, your apron strings to have a look and have a go, it's important just to say, Do you know what, I'm going to give 10 minutes. People can wait. Let's get the wee one. Let's get a stool up and just, just let them get involved. Because the chances are they'll probably be stuck in it for about five or 10 minutes. Then they'll go back to doing what they're doing. Okay. But if you shun them away, They'll be shunned away from food forever. And if you're stressed and, and stuff like that, it will frighten them from cooking. So it's just a case of just going, do you know what? We're going to take 10 minutes and we're going to do something. We're going to whatever it may be. And it makes a massive difference to a, a young person's view of food. And I know you've got plans for a, a book number two. Could you yep. share any of those plans with us? Kitchen Essentials has got no Scottish food in it. I put in Cullen Skink because I firmly believe it's a king of soups. I think it's the easiest and tastiest soup you can make. Um, and even when I go to uh, New England, they agree with me that it's better than their New England chowder, but very similar. Um, but what I wanted to do was to do a kind of grown-up Scottish recipe book. And I wanted to sort of look at our past, but, but make it doable for today and doable for the house. But I wanted to do something that that was a true reflection of, of uh, where Scottish food came from and why we eat the way we do. Um, and even looking at kind of modern Scotland as well, you know, things like the chicken tikka masala is Scottish, you know, it's, it was invented in Glasgow, you know, so we've got, we're, we're influenced by loads and loads of different cultures. And, you know, when you look at the, the Commonwealth and, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of different, uh, people come from all over the world to live in Scotland, you know, at various times. We've got a really strong Italian culture, so we've developed our own kind of Italian food as well as Indian and and yeah. uh, the Chinese, my Hong Kong sort of type food. But um, I think there's a, there's a good story about the, the journey of Scottish food. Before we, we go, I wanted to maybe ask what your food-related, your fondest food-related memory is. Um, probably... Helensborough picking mussels off the beach. I wanted to thank you again for, for your friendship, uh, for being with us today, and uh, all the best, Gary. Be safe and be well. You too. Thanks for having us. Hello there. A very good afternoon to you all. My name is Jamie McGeechan, aka Little Fire. It's an absolute pleasure to be singing for you this afternoon as part of the Chicago Highland Games. Hope you're all doing well, folks. I'm going to sing a wee song by Robert Burns. This is one of my favourites. It's called Green Grow the Rashes. And I had the privilege to record this inside Burns Cottage in Alloway in Scotland a couple of years ago. This is Green Grow the Rashes. Oh, the sweetest 
been to Milo, I see so. The worldly race me riches chase And riches still me fly them more And though at last they catch them fast Their hearts can need and enjoy them more Green grow the rushes oh Green grow the rushes oh The sweetest hours I ever spent a spin to mango I see so And I spin to mango I see so And I spin to mango I see so And I spin to mango I All nature swears her lovely dears Her noblest work she classes all oh. Her praise is hard, she tried on man And then she made the lassies all oh. Green grow the rushes all oh. Green grow the rushes all oh. The sweetest hers I ever spent Spin to mango lassies oh. Thank you very much. My name is Jamie McGeekin. That was Green Grow the Rashes. See you later. Thank you for tuning in. Bye bye. Hello, uh, my name is Lindsay Sorrell and I have the honour of sitting on the board of the Illinois St Andrews Society and um, I moved to Chicago 20 years ago uh, to come to university and had no plans on staying beyond my time uh, in graduate school and uh, Chicago has uh, taken hold of me um, but I certainly miss home terribly and uh, being involved in the Chicago Scots gives me a sense of place and um, it's been wonderful to connect with people from home and to introduce my American friends to Haggis and the Highland Games um, and certainly having opportunities to share a whiskey with them uh, is most welcome. So it doesn't take much to convince friends to join you um, at Chicago Scots events um, and the philanthropic element of the society is very near and dear to my heart. So uh, I look forward to the virtual games. I hope you all can join us and Slangevar! We can't meet in person this year for the Highland Games, so instead we're meeting in cyberspace. But this gives us a wonderful opportunity to pivot and to look at the games from a different perspective. We can explore the history of the various parts of the games and meet some of the personalities that make the games so special. No Highland Games would be complete without heavy athletics. The iconic caber toss and those incredible athletes, the throwers. Jason Clevenger, who chairs our Highland Games Heavy Athletics Committee, made a suggestion that we use the opportunity to get to know two of the leading throwers in the field today. Alyssa Happner and Spencer Tyler are both world record holders. Alyssa held four world records and Spencer five. Indeed, at the top of today's show, you saw Spencer break the world record for the sheath toss at our games last year in 2019. So let's go and have a conversation with Jason, Alyssa and Spencer. Jason, can you tell me a little bit about what you see as being the uh, true essence of Scottish heavy athletics, its roots, its growth and how it's got to the point that it's at now? Well, from what we all understand is is that the the Scottish chieftains would gather um, their best warriors and put them to 
two different tests, and that is is the origins of the the games throwing stones um, and such. Uh, as far as where I see the the Chicago games going is I want to build a premier platform to where throwers from around the country would want to be part of it. Amateurs throwing on, on Friday night as part of the Friday night fling. And then my, my whole goal would be to uh, have a, a split field of five men and five women mm-hmm. on Saturday to compete in front of the crowd. So uh, let's say you're, you're a crowd favorite here in Chicago. This is your hometown. And though you're in Texas now, I'm glad to see that you've taken Chicago with you with the picture on, on the wall there. And <laughs> if everyone enjoys watching you and cheering you on in Chicago. We certainly miss you, but we look forward to welcoming you back. Could, could you tell us your views on the expanding role of women's athletics? Yeah, so the women have actually really just blown up in the last few years. And the women's class, I mean, this ranges from um, teenagers getting involved. I just threw with a teenager last week who was their first games. And then you've got, it is incredible to go to a world championship where you see 80 plus year old women that are out there doing all of these events under the sun. So the women's class, it just ranges from everything. You've got women joining for different reasons. It's the clan lineage where they've gone back in their family traditions. I had people that have stumbled upon it and was like, hey, I'll do this one day. Um, it is friends dragging each other so that they can get addicted to the sport too. Or it is family affair where you've got um, aunts and moms and daughters doing it together and they're encouraging each other and sweating it out on the field. So it is, it is just great to see and hear everybody's backstories as to why they're getting involved and seeing women out there really testing themselves, seeing what they can do. And it is, it is exciting to watch. To have something that you've trained and just given hours and hours to and to actually see that in, to come into fruition. For me, um, when I broke my first world record, I visualized every single thing that I had done. So I see the people that are out on my runs that I wave to every single day. Um, I think of my family that has sacrificed hours so that I could be out in the world traveling. I mean, I, everything just goes through my head because all of those hours led you to your goal. And Is there a special moment or memory that you really feel was important to you that you'll take from a Highland Games for me, it's the people of the games, and I know it sounds corny. However, um, traveling from coast to coast and to different countries competing, it is just unfathomable who you meet. Um, I have been able to take pictures with the smallest of the, <laughs> of the crowd, taking pictures of them, and having some incredible conversations with parents. And those are the things that stick out to me, because me, I am an educator, I am a teacher, and impacting students is one thing. But impacting a single mother who's trying to get through to her teenage daughter who just feels different and doesn't feel like the norm that she sees in magazines. Well, to be able to help that mom, considering I've never been a mom, that is a unique feeling that I just never thought that I would have. And so those are the memories that are like, I feel honored to be part of the sport because it's given me so many advantages and opportunities and these unique situations where I've been able to impact somebody else that I just never would have fathomed would have been true. So those are the memories and it's the crowd, that crowd participation. You just don't know who's out there and what they're going through and, and being able to be relatable, even though you guys are strangers you never met before that day, but some of those relationships have just bloomed since then. And it's, it is something that again, just makes the Highland games just shockingly amazing. You of course are are known to many as the Michael Jordan of the sport, having uh, broken and held so many of those records and of course you broke uh, one in Chicago last year uh, the celebration that Melissa was just talking about was incredible it was infectious and you felt it across the, the whole field um, tell me what it's like to break a world record what goes through your heart and your mind oh man it's it's, it's really hard to explain something that equals uh, a world record especially in a sport you know, like, like Highland games, it's one of the oldest sports, competitive sports that exist. So like Alyssa and myself to do something 
at a greater level than anyone's done in so many centuries. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to let all that sink in in a joyous moment, you, you know, but re really it's just flat out elation being uh, super excited. And like Jason hit on earlier, man, when the crowd's in it, yeah. God, I feel like I could walk through walls. Uh, I mean, it's, and, and the Chicago crowd being right there by the, uh, uh, the tent where the sheaf was set up, those guys were, they were all in and it was what an atmosphere that was. And it was raining. It was, it was kind of a nasty day and everybody was, you know, it, they they were there. They were fully involved. It was fantastic. And how how do you see the future of the sport? Where where's the next Alyssa or Spencer coming from? Um, where, where, how does the sport grow? Well, hopefully, the next Alyssa is one of my daughters. <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll be coming up and competing in the next decade or so. So I got high hopes for them. Yeah. Uh, and on the men's side, you know, the men's side, the, the, the crop of athletes kind of goes through peaks and valleys. Um, and, and that peak and valley always seems to creep upward. Um, and right now, as of last year, you know, some of the guys at the top of the sport in 2019 are the best that have ever, uh, you know, so, some of the Americans uh, that are here. And then you got some of the guys from overseas. Uh, like Vladislav Tulicek, he's a guy from Czech Republic. He's just, he's, he's a monster, and he's, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. I don't know how old he is, but uh, if he's around for much longer, he, he's going he's gonna to set the Highland Game world on fire. Well, wow, that'd be great fun. Yeah. I mean, that'll be after I retire. I don't plan on letting him beat me ever. Be it in Chicago or, or one of the other games. What's your favorite memory? Oh, man. You, you know, I've never really thought about that, but my knee-jerk thought, whenever you ask that question, it would be the first day I ever picked up a Highland Games implement. One of my old college coaches and friends, Quint Milis, um, he thought I would be good at, at this sport, and uh, we were actually camping. We were at a fishing camp, and we would – you know, kind of rugged style fishing camp uh, right on the river. And we, you know, threw some tents up or, or slept in a truck. And about halfway through the day, he showed me these implements and the 56 pound weight, which is the worst one that exists ever. Um, he handed me that and I was barefoot and I had had a few drinks. And that's how I learned the Highland Games was in a riverbed barefoot with the 56 pound weight for the first time. And, and that's, that sticks with me. And as soon as I did it, I turned back and looked at him right away. Like, was that good? And he was like, well, no, maybe I was wrong. You might not have a future in this game. <laughs> but uh, that, that might be one of my favorite memories of, of Highland Games so far. I really appreciate everything. Look forward to seeing you all in Chicago next year in 2021. Jason and the team are going to put on a great uh, games for, for you. And I hope to see you breaking some more world records in the future in Chicago. Yes, sir. Thank Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. My favorite memories of the Highland Games, other than watching my daughters compete, is usually food related, and being introduced to the Scotch egg is probably at the top of the list. This dance is the sailor's hornpipe. It mimics all the shipboard duties, such as hauling rope climbing rigging, and swabbing the decks.
from the land that we grew up in to this, our Highland home, from the joy and solace we long for to this place where we belong, from the past we've lived and loved to a future where we're not alone. We come here and come together in this, our Highland home because our hearts are in the highlands. Wherever we roam. to that point where Bugs Bunny would come in and say that's all folks but not quite we have one treat left in store the mighty scary vor they've become great friends of the Chicago Scots over the years they've played shows at our Highland Games and all over Chicago as fundraisers for us and at the Feast of the Haggis in fact they allowed us to use one of their tunes happy to be home as the theme for our last capital campaign, which helped us build the McLean House, our home for people living with memory loss here at Caledonia Senior Living. And we'll always be grateful to Scary Four for allowing us that kindness. That song speaks to everything we are, home, family, and love. And so to take us home with happy to be home, here is, Scary Vore. I take this road and every other day to leave for somewhere new and far away. Though I may be gone, please don't be blue. My heart is always there.
Oh, the Scotland shop. This is the Illinois tartan. It was made in the Scottish borders in my hometown of Duns. Here, Jack. Folks, thank you for joining us at the 34th annual Scottish Festival and Highland Games. We'll see you next year. Please be safe and be well. Cheers. Take me home, Jack.